I want to now do a quick demonstration on relative risk, otherwise known as risk ratio within SPSS. So let's start by grabbing ourselves some data. So here's the data I'm going to use. It's a cohort study, hence the relative risk, risk ratio. If it had been a, um, a case control looking backwards in time, we'd have used the odds ratio. So it's important to get those two the right way around. Forward in time, cohort study, we can look at the risk ratio. And uh, this is what's known as a frequency table, otherwise also known as a contingency table. And this made up data has the exposure category of either smoker or non-smoker and the outcome category, the disease category of cancer versus no cancer. It doesn't say which type of cancer, but we can imagine it's going to be lung cancer. And we've got 200,000 participants altogether that we've uh, followed over time. Uh, unrealistic, I know, and this actually would have been better as a retrospective study, but I'm going to uh, leave that to one side. We're going to keep the spirit of this data. Um, so you've got 100,000 smokers matched with 100,000 non-smokers, and hopefully you've matched them for, uh, for gender, for lifestyle, etc., etc. And the only difference between the two, in theory, is their exposure to this particular category, in this case, smoking. Um, so you can see that the just at a glance, we can see that there's far more smokers contract lung cancer compared to non-smokers. But as I uh, said a moment ago, this is made up data. So don't take this as proof of anything other than a uh, useful data for illustrating this. OK, so let's go into SPSS. And now I've already put the values into SPSS, but I need to remind you of something, and that is that two things. SPSS has an extra sheet called Variable View as well as the Data View, so we're going to fill that in first. I've already filled it in, but I'll come to that in a second. Plus, this was summary data. This is frequencies, not raw data. I did not have 200,000 lines in my data uh, view. That would have taken too long, so I've summarized the data. So I need to remember to let SPSS know that what I have is frequencies. But before I go to that, look at my variables. There's two obvious nominal, otherwise known as grouping variables, exposure and condition, and they've been set to be both nominal. I've also asked them to be numeric to make my life easier so I can do some labeling because SPSS has some rather curious and old fashioned um, rules regarding naming of variables. So what I've done is I've given them a label, exposure category for exposure and degree, disease condition for condition. And then on the values for my coding part, if I just click on those three dots, you can see that I've already preset these. A one means smoker, a two means non-smoker. Click OK. And similar, similar, similar for cancer, a one means cancer and a two means no cancer. OK, time to put the values in. But before I do, that final variable, which I've called count, it's just a frequency, um, otherwise known as proportion, um, and that is also set to be nominal, it's just a count. So the data view doesn't look quite like my table did a second ago. There's my table, and it's not quite arranged in the same way in SPSS, but we just have to hold our nerve here. So for exposure one, and two, just remember to, I don't have to keep remembering what one and two means. I can use this um, toggle button for the labels. For smokers who get cancer, um, I've got a count of 20,000. For smoker who doesn't get cancer, I've got 80,000. For a non-smoker who gets cancer, I've got a small number of 300. And a non-smoker who doesn't get cancer, the great majority of that particular group, 99,700. So far, so good. So that's my data put in, and I'll be able to check in a moment that I've done this correct, correctly by comparing the contingency table of the output with what I had in my PowerPoint slide a moment ago. But before I can proceed, I must let SPSS know that this is frequency values, not uh, raw data. So I click on data. OK, oops, make sure I've got the right one here. Click on data, go over down, almost off your screen. It's called weight cases. Click on that one um, and it's got my three variables here, possible variables in the left hand pane. And the default is to say do not wait cases, treat the data in SPSS as raw data. But that's not true in my case. So I'm going to say, look, I, I do need to let you know what the frequencies are. And it's the count variable, the one I've given the label frequency. So I click on the arrow to put that into there. Once I click OK, that means for the duration of this particular session with SPSS, it will know that the variable count is to be treated as a frequency, not as a raw data value. OK, how do I run the relative risk or risk uh, ratio? This is 
almost identical to running a chi-squared test. I go into analyze, into descriptive statistics, and go down to cross tabs. I then have to set it up very similar, the exact same step as I did for chi-squared. So exposure will go in my rows, disease will go in my columns. And by the way, this doesn't matter too much which way around, but it's often nicer to get it set up in a way that you, you are happy with. OK, so far I have not yet told SPSS which test I want, so I click on that button statistics and this is the same pop up window we had uh, when we ran the chi squared but today instead of clicking chi squared and we go down here and click risk and it's the only one i'm going to click for this particular test now that i always told you there's at least another version of risk there's a risk ratio and the uh, odds ratio so we have to make sure with our output table we're reading the correct one that's for a moment's time so let's click continue click ok here comes the output file, which I'll just drag across here so we can look at it. And this is where we check that we put everything in correctly. Yes, there were 200,000 participants all together, so that checks that one. And then here's a more familiar looking contingency table, and it looks fine. If I just compare and contrast that middle table with what I had a moment ago, I'm thinking, good, it, everything looks fine. So with my output file there, we can now say, OK, so what are the values? Now with a chi-square test, we got a p-value. In fact, the great majority of, of inferential statistical tests give you a p-value and we know the rules. P-value of 0.05 or less, we can declare statistical significance, but there is no p-value in sight here. Instead, they've given us this thing called the 95% confidence interval. First concern of ours is which row am I looking at? Well, I'm looking at the second row because I know that a risk ratio, relative risk, is for a cohort study moving forward in time with the uh, participants. So uh, this is the one I want to read. So these are the variables I want to read, sorry, the outcome values. So this 66.66 is my test statistic, which got a lower value, lower confidence interval value of 59.5 and an upper one of 74.9. Before I worry about these lower and upper values, what does this number 66.667 tell me? If I go back to my slides, the previous slide that I took off all the um, the calculations, when we did this by hand, we were able to look at the the, the relative risk uh, of cancers in smoker and the relative risk of cancer in non-smokers, or just the risk rather, and we found that it was 20% a risk of cancer for smokers and only 0.3 of a percent, so less than 1% of a risk of cancer in non-smokers. And the relative risk is, unsurprisingly, those two numbers compared, so it would be 20 over 0 0.3, which is 66.67, or that we've just rounded here to 67. So we can say from this data, this particular group of participants, that our estimate of what's happening out there in the population is that a smoker is 67 times higher at risk of getting cancer compared to a non-smoker. So that's what that value there in the output was we will say that the elevation the 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 enhancement of the the risk of getting uh, in this case cancer if you're exposed to the condition in this case smoking is huge it's 67 times more um more likely to get let's say lung cancer now we kind of know this historically that this is true but if i'm looking at this data as a statistician and i'm having to make sense of it i can't just say oh therefore that is the truth it's 67 times uh, higher in terms of risk um, i've got to be able to say whether my data is statistically significant now in a great majority of statistical tests you're looking at the differences between group a and group b or before and after and you actually have a measure so the null hypothesis is always there is no difference and so then you would uh, your null value would be the value zero. So if you were ever presented, say, in research papers or wherever, with a confidence interval, you'd look to see if the lower and upper value defined a region which contains that null value. As I say, in most tests, it would be the value zero. However, for the relative risk, as the name implies, it's a uh, it's a fraction. So if the two groups did have the same outcome, then the same value over the same value equals one. It's only when you take away the same value from itself, you get zero. So our null value is one. And I'm perhaps going on about it too much, but I've just do a, do a double check to check that that lower value of 59 
a Newport value of 74 does not contain the value one. And, and it clearly doesn't, it's way beyond that. So in terms of the numbers, 59, 60, 61, et cetera, up to 74, the, the value one, the null value is way out of that. So this allows us to state with absolute confidence that we are statistically significant with this data. So we would put that in our report. We'd say that there is an elevated risk of 67 times more likely to get the, the, the disease of say lung cancer if you're a smoker compared to a non-smoker. And this is statistically significant because the precision of the measurement as defined, as explained by the 95% confidence interval, does not contain the value one. In fact, 59 to 74 tells us we are so far out that we are very, very confident uh, of our results. Often this range of values is sometimes also expressed as the plausibility range. What is the plausible range of value for which the true population parameter, in here the elevated risk, lies? Because even though we had a really nice big um, sample in this fictitious piece of research of 200,000, it could still not represent fully the population at large because of certain statistical fluctuations. You think of flicking a coin, you can always get lucky runs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that's why you can never say for sure with 100% precision because you have not tested the entire population. But what we can do is we can give a range of plausibility. It just adds weight to any conclusion we, we may draw. And by the way, this elevated risk doesn't imply, oh, there's a causal link between smoking and lung cancer. We know that was uh, established, but through other means. But certainly this points to a um, something worthy of serious attention, and that is that exposing to the particular risk, known risk factor of smoking, there is an elevated risk of getting cancer. And so that would have added weight, as it were, to the uh, to the discussion going on. I'm hoping that was of some help to you. Let me just go back to my uh, main page and stop the sharing there for a second. Um, we wanted it to be a, a brief look, but hopefully if you've seen the chi-squared test um, video as well as the risk ratio test, you can see how they're both effectively uh, the same mechanism that you do within uh, SPSS itself. There's just a subtle difference and that will take maybe more than one uh, look at before you can convince yourself of this. It might require more reading on your part. Okay, I'll stop the recording there and I'll see you in the next one. Take care and cheerio.